Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, admittedly, this is not the passage of Scripture that I would have imagined you bringing us to on Father's Day. And yet here we are, again, holding out our hands in surrender. You always know what's best. You always give us exactly what we need. And I pray that right now, Lord, you would fill this space inside of us and around us, that your light and life and love would be what we receive from this point forward, even as you press and challenge us. That, Lord, today would be a day of us tasting and seeing just how good you are and how much you want to set us free. So, Lord, we, we give you ourselves to the degree we know how, and we ask that you show us more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. All right, so an interesting, maybe odd question to start us off with this morning. Where are you triggered right now? Where are you triggered right now? Yeah, we love these questions, <laughs> right? Because here's the reality. Days of celebration are what? They're wonderful. They're wonderful. But they're also wonderful triggers. Let's think about it for just a second. We just celebrated a baptism of a little baby, right? And last week we talked about new babies being born. And that's wonderful. We celebrate that. It's beautiful. But what it also is is a reminder of what we may not have, but we, but we want. It's also a reminder of maybe what we have and don't want. It's also a reminder of, of past hurts. And so we're struggling. We're triggered even in the beauty by the pain and the lack that we see. What about Father's Day, right? Father's Day is super encouraging when we think about awesome dads, like Scott was saying, when you can celebrate things that our dads have done that are great, or the people in this room, spiritual dads that have done that are great, it's awesome, but it also triggers daddy wounds. And I've yet to meet someone who doesn't have some because of how vitally important dad is in our lives. Mom as well. But today's Father's Day, so that's what we're going to talk about, dads, right? So it can actually trigger us to anger and to sadness. What, what about Juneteenth? Scott also mentioned that. Today is Juneteenth. Today's worth celebrating. It's, it's the literal emancipation of chattel slaves here in the United States. It's the last vestiges of chattel slavery in Texas that were removed in 1865, and we celebrate that today. That's worth celebrating. Amen? Amen. Well, 
at the same time, it also brings up all sorts of pain and sorrow, things like shame and the, the different warrings that are going on even today, where, where it, it's, for, for some in the room, even today, there's a struggle to want to enter into the goodness because of the mixed bag and the struggle you see on the other side. And it's like, what do we do with that? We're triggered. Today, we're talking about money. <laughs> Money's a good thing, amen? Wow. <laughs> if you don't want your money, I'm going to have this bowl out here. <laughs> Money's a good thing. Yes? Okay, it is a good thing. But you know what's not a good thing? The love of money. The need for money. Whether it's because you don't have enough, and that's a different kind of struggle, or because you can never get enough. Idolatry. The love of money. So we've, we've talked about pretty much everything that could possibly trigger you already this morning. Are you glad you're here? Right? So what do you do when you're triggered is the next question. Because if we are being triggered, what do we do when we're triggered? Because there's only two options, self-protection or self-denial. Self-protection is me saying, I am going to do everything in my power to make sure that I'm safe, even at the expense of you. Self-denial is saying, I cannot make myself safe. So I'm going to deny that right and privilege and put on instead the truth of the one who is my protector. This morning, we continue in our series that we've been calling There is More to Following Jesus as we look through the Gospel of Luke. And what we're going to talk about is this very principle, that to follow Jesus is to practice self-denial even with money. So money is going to be the jumping off point, but please don't get stuck there. God is going to challenge us there, but God is not interested in your money. What is he interested in? You, you, your heart. So if you choke on the money stuff, realize there's a reason why Jesus spoke about money more than anything else. And a reason why Jesus says the love of money is the root of all evil, because he knows what money is. It's such a trap for us. And so first, diving into this passage, verse 1 there's talking about this dishonest manager. Dishonesty is, is described in this passage as wasting, or maybe even more specifically, stealing. It's taking what is, does not belong to the manager, and the manager taking it for himself instead of actually using it for the master's purposes. Wasting or stealing. You remember last week when we talked about the fact that when, when God repeats himself, or in this case, when Jesus in the flesh repeats himself, he's probably wanting to get us to see something. He wants our attention. Well, this is now the third time in just a couple of chapters that Jesus is talking about this issue, and he's going to talk about it again. So I think we should listen. And I think we should let it soak in and really wrestle. And part of the beauty of doing this together is we're community, so we wrestle together. So it's not about you taking it and going and wrestling on your own. You can do that, and you need to do that with the Lord but also wrestling in community. And you know what the best kind of community to wrestle with is? Safe, for sure, but those who are going to sharpen you, not your cheerleaders who are only going to tell you everything you're thinking and doing are, is right. You want those who are going to love you enough to call you out and to literally help polish you, take off the rough edges. What Jesus is getting at in our passage for this morning is that there's a reality to which we, we all struggle with, with actually using God, God's resources in a way that's stealing from him. And so in Luke chapter 12, we talked about the parable of the master's return a couple weeks ago, where it's not using the master's resources to care for those in, in, uh, that you have responsible, responsibility over, right? And so you, the master has left, and you are the manager, and you're supposed to use his resources to care for those who have needs, who are underneath your authority, we all have people around us who have needs. How are we doing? Right? Parable of the prodigal son, we talked about that last week. This idea of, of spending all of dad's stuff on me. I want you to notice the theme that happens all throughout all of these passages. It always comes back to that one two-letter word that rhymes with snee. Me. 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 In just a couple chapters, he's going to talk about the parable of the talents, where again, 
the, the worker is going to be criticized for not investing the master's stuff so that he can get a return on the investment and therefore have more of the master's stuff to use to care for those in his, need, in, in, in his, in his purview. Do you see this consistent theme that Lord Jesus is pulling out in front of us again this morning? How much of the money that's in your bank account right now belongs to him? All of it. All of it. How much of it does he want you to give back to him? All of it. You're like, well, how am I supposed to live? Please don't misunderstand. He's not saying just give all your money to the church. Like, isn't that great? The pastor wants you to give all your money to the church. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I've given you that money, yes, to fill your bellies. I care about you eating. Yes, to buy clothing. I care about you not being naked. Yes, to have a house. I care about your shelter. But I've given you that money so that two things can happen in addition to what we just talked about. One is so that you can actually declare with your actions in front of money, you're not my God. I'm giving it away. I'm undermining your authority in my life by giving you money away. But also, in so doing, I can actually be the hands and feet of Jesus for the person that's in this room right now praying, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent next month. For the person you're about to meet when you leave this place at the restaurant who doesn't have enough to pay their bill. To that homeless person you're going to walk by on Monday who's starving. All that you have belongs to him. And when you live in a way that actually testifies to that, you've surrendered it all. Not just some. Not just a little. All. What's made clear in the two verses that we did not read this morning that, that are right after our passage is that Jesus is talking once again to the Pharisees. Aren't you glad you're not a Pharisee? Man, those guys got a bad rap. You know who they represent? Church people. Oh. <laughs> Wait a second. What do you mean, church people? Yeah. The Pharisees were the church people and the really good church people. So to put it in the context of what we're talking about with money, the Pharisees are the people who always tithed. Tithing is you come to God, it's all yours. Here's what God expects on the front end, 10% of all of your money. <gasps> okay, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, right? Like that's a lot of money. How am I supposed to do that? And then on top of that, he's asking for more. To be generous on top of the tithe that you start with. <gasps> How am I supposed to, how are you supposed to what? Who gave you all the money you have? Who's promised to provide for you? Who's going to take care of all your needs? Who wants you to surrender so that you're not underneath the guise and power of money? That has a, a, a demonic name, by the way, mammon. There's actually dark power behind the allure of money. Have you thought about that? Jesus is the one who's challenging the Pharisees here who are tithing. They're doing the letter of the law and undermining the heart of the law. Let me explain what I'm talking about. They're the ones who every Sabbath, they bring their tithe. They were the ones who were doing it religiously, pun intended. And yet what they were doing when they left, when they walked away, was they were walking by that homeless person walking by that hungry person, walking by that sick person, and feeling justified in so doing because they must be sinners. They must be undeserving. They must be punished by God. So they were looking for the deserving poor, and they couldn't find any. You know what's funny about that? When you look for the deserving poor, the poor who deserve your help, guess how many people you're always going to find? Zero. Because there's no such thing as deserving poor. There's just poor. There's just needy. There's just those who need a hand up and not just a hand out. Jesus is challenging the Pharisees and challenging us in this passage to think beyond simply the letter of the law and to, to live with the heart of the law in their lives. 
and they weren't. So he's calling them out here. In fact, if you listened to the parable that Jesus told, it was probably very odd to you. Because at first glance, it makes it sound like Jesus is saying, hey, the dishonest manager who went back and took all of the master's stuff and all the debts and said, hey, what is your debt? It's 100, cut it in half to 50. What's your debt? 50, cut it in half to 25. And it says that the master called him shrewd. You're like, wait a second. Are we, are we, celebrating? Are we celebrating the fact that this guy is doing something that's dishonest? That he's stealing more from the master? No. What Jesus is saying is this. When you live in a culture that plays by certain rules, that has certain standards, or to put it differently, that walks the path of self-protection, you will celebrate one another's attempts at self-protection. But you know who's always going to lose? The one who has less. The one who has less. And so this master, who is dishonest, fires the manager who's also dishonest even as he celebrates the dishonesty. So when we live by the standard of self-protection, we always lose, even when it seems like we're going to win because you know what? There's always someone higher than you in the pecking order. And if it's always my will against your will, someone's going to lose and it's always going to be the one with less power, with less status, with less ability. So what does it look like, friends? for us to not live according to the standard. Because what Jesus is pointing his, his finger at is true in our lives as well. It's true. Money is often the currency of self-protection. Can you read that with me? Money is often the currency of self-protection. It is. We use money as power and pretend like we're not. A few examples that all of which are going to tempt some of you in here to be offended. And what I want you to do instead of taking offense is to listen to the point and be challenged by the point. In the NBA, for instance, the NBA, if you've watched any NBA games, basketball games, you've seen they've gone all in on the BLM movement. All of their jerseys have it. All of the, the stuff in the background has it. They're all in, and they're, they're taking a hard stance against what they're seeing as oppression, right? They're taking a hard stance on that, and they think this is the right thing to do. Okay, and if that was indeed their only motivator in the NBA, then you know what they wouldn't be doing? Buying shoes from China. If the very thing that they're standing up against, oppression, was what they were actually wanting to live by, that standard, then they wouldn't be literally funding sweatshops in China where the, the Uyghur people, the Muslim Chinese people, are being slaughtered. Genocide is the right description of what's happening to that people group. And when the NBA and its stars look over there because all of the market share that China has and all the money that comes out of China, you know what they do? This. So it becomes this. We're standing against oppression, but not really. Money is the driver, friends, that allows us to do things that otherwise we would think deplorable. Any kind of oppression is deplorable. Any kind. We need to stand against all of it, but the reason why we don't is because money equals freedom. Money equals power. Money equals life. And therefore, we justify. We justify all these little things because I need more life. I'm protecting myself. Social media. Perhaps some of you saw the study that came out maybe nine months ago or so where it was undeniable evidence that the use of social media in the lives of our teens, and in particular our teenage girls, increases the rate of depression and suicide exponentially. That's Facebook, Instagram, all the ones, right? They're all on that list. And thank God since that study so much has changed. Or not. Nothing has changed. Nothing. 
in an attempt to look like we care. Look, we have this study. Look, we did it, and we see that, and we apologize for that. Nothing has changed. You want to know why? Go see the social experiment. You are not the consumer, friends. You're the product when it comes to social media. You are what's being sold. It's always about money. Money. This next one's going to be hard. Planned Parenthood takes a really hard stance for caring for women. Should we care for women? Yes. Yes. Does women's health, should that matter? Should that be primary? Yes. But why does Planned Parenthood perform more abortions than anything else? Do you know why? Have you seen the movie Unplanned? Please go see it if you've not. I don't recommend it for children. Planned Parenthood has so much encouragement for abortion because they make money off the body parts that are left over. Friends, it's always about the money. Is it ever going to be okay for us to sacrifice the least, no matter what version of least on that list we're talking about? Is it ever okay for us to sacrifice, for us to oppress, so that we can have more of the thing that we think we need? Money, which equals power, which equals life? Do you see the consistent theme here? There's one more on this list that we've not talked about. I think maybe I'll skip right over it, right? No. What about in the church? Where do we fall into the same pit? In the church, we fall into the same pit when we say this. You're faithful. God's going to bless you with lots of money. Health and wealth, right? If you're a good person, God's going to give you riches. Really? So by that standard, Jesus was a horrible person. Because Jesus died homeless, naked, completely, if they had welfare, would have been on it, but did, sort of was on it with, from the generosity of his neighbors. Jesus lived up to none of those standards. Neither did Paul. When we say as a community, as a church, hey, God is going to bless us when we're good, which, listen, we talked about karma versus grace. God gives us well beyond what we deserve, and God doesn't give us what we deserve. But at the same time, God wants us to be faithful. This isn't a, a, a challenge to not be faithful. It's simply saying this. When we say and believe God is going to bless us with abundant riches when we walk in faithfulness, we are declaring to the world that God thinks the way we think. That the end goal is for us to have money. Because when we have money, we have, what's that word again? Life, power, security. And that's a trap, friends. It's a trap that on so many levels we fall into and reap the consequences of. It's a trap that Jesus points out just a few verses after the text that we read when he tells another parable of Lazarus and the rich man. These two, Lazarus is the only one named, the rich man isn't. Lazarus is a poor beggar full of sores that the dogs lick during the day as he sits by the gate of this rich man. And he's so hungry, he's, he's aching for the scraps that fall from the rich man's table. And Jesus says on the same day they both die. And Lazarus is taken by the angels to the bosom of Abraham, to sit by Abraham's side. What a beautiful picture on Father's Day. That the angels would take him to Father Abraham, to there be comforted. And it says that the rich man went to the other side of the chasm, to hell. He says he looked over the chasm. He was so thirsty because there's so much pain and, and, and agony on the other side. And he, he calls out to Abraham, Abraham, Send Lazarus over with some water for me. The audacity of this guy. He still thinks he's in control. He still thinks he has the power when all of his money's back on earth. Send Lazarus over. I'm thirsty. And Abraham says, you've already had your pleasure. In this life, you, you lived it up. You got what you deserved. Now Lazarus, who suffered through life, he is going to be honored he is going to be fed and cared for. He is going to live this life forever. 
you would think, oh my goodness, like if that was the case, I would want someone to go back and warn my friends. Well, that's exactly what the rich man says. Well, then send Lazarus back to tell my brothers because they need to be warned of this. And Abraham says, no, it's too late for that. He goes, well, no, but listen, they'll listen to him because if, he, if someone comes back from the dead, surely, surely my brothers will listen. And Abraham says, they have the law and the prophets. In other words, they have the Bible. If they don't listen to what's written in the Bible, listen. They won't listen even if someone comes back from the dead. Jesus is telling this parable to describe very clearly that when we put our hope, our hearts, into our money, when we worship it, when it becomes the way of self-protection and self-preservation, we have been duped. We take none of it with us but what it does is it's, it, it serves as a living testimony of where we've actually put our heart. Where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So if our heart is in our money and not in our maker, then all of a sudden what we get is what money earns us as opposed to what our maker wins for us. The good news of the gospel is we don't actually get what we deserve, that our maker is the one who does come to actually pay the debt for us, to make a way for us to come to heaven, so that even when we're like Lazarus, feeling like, oh my goodness, the world is crashing down on me, Lazarus is clearly someone who's unclean, has sores all over him, can't work, can't provide for himself, seems like everyone has looked past me, no one's my help, who's going to come for me? And he dies in that place, and you think, well, what a miserable existence, except for the rest of eternity. Because he had Jesus. Because he put his hope in Yahweh as God. So that what happened on the title page of his life would actually shape the eternity that was to come. What are we doing in our title pages? What are we doing with our money? How many of us need to hear this warning this morning when it comes to where our hearts are? Because we can follow the letter of the law and miss the heart of the law. We can miss the heart of our God when it comes to actually using his resources. Jesus wants us to know, friends, that it's always been about the heart. Always. You cannot love both God and money. When, to do that is to be a Pharisee. Is to say, Okay, God, even if I have to give a tithe of my money, here's my tithe, and the rest of my life is mine. Your tithe is there to declare where your heart is. God, here's my tithe. Whatever else you need, where do, where do you need me? Where are you going to send me? Whatever it is, I want to go because I'm your man. I'm your lady. I'm yours. It's about the heart, friends. It's about the heart. Are we going to protect ourselves or are we going to deny ourselves? Because the way of self-denial is actually the way of life. Jesus is the one who said, if anyone would come after me, he or she must deny himself or herself, pick up their cross, and follow me. He leads us down the pathway of the cross because he knows that the resurrection comes through the grave. We spend so much of our time avoiding the path of the cross, the Via Della Rosa, we spend so much time avoiding it. I don't like suffering. I don't want my cross. I don't want to deny myself. And we've misunderstood that is the path of life. There is no other. There is no other. So when it comes to our money, here's the challenge. Don't steal. Don't steal. What does that mean, don't steal? It means invest God's resources with your whole heart which sometimes means he's going to ask you to give sacrificially. There's someone who's probably watching if we are online right now. Are we online right now? Who knows? Wonderful. Well, I have a friend who's probably watching if we are, who has a birthday today, who's one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life. And I'm not going to mention him by name because he'll be mad at me if I do. But when he had nothing, he was generous. And when he had a lot, he was generous. You know why? Because he trusted God. When he had nothing and he was still generous, wow, did that challenge everyone around him to grow, to trust, 
to be whole. When he gave and when he had plenty, wow, did that challenge everyone around him to trust and to follow his example. And I've been blessed by you, brother. And we've been blessed by you. And I share his example as an encouragement to us that it can be done. And when it happens, life is planted in so many lives around you. We praise God for you, birthday boy. What about when it comes to kids? When it comes to kids, friends, this is hard, right? What does it look like to be content with where God has us? When God gives us a gift, whether it's the gift of having children or the gift of not having children. Did you hear what I just said? It's kind of like that gift of singleness that nobody wants, right? Until you have it and you realize what God's talking about. Because there's such opportunity for intimacy when you don't have a spouse or children. They are there as windows into the intimacy that we can have with him. The gift God gives us when we don't have those things is he draws near and gives us more of himself. So if you have that gift, what does it look like to be content? And I've learned the secret of being content in all circumstances, Paul writes, because he's trusting the heart of his father. One of the ways you'll know that you're actually content is if you're engaged. You can't say, oh yeah, I'm content. Right? If you're pushing away from everyone, if you're guarding your heart, you're not content, you're self-protective. If you're angry and pretending like you're not, everyone around you knows you're fooling no one. Sorry if that was a surprise to you this morning. But when you're content, there's sorrow and grief, but there's also surrender. Surrender. What about when it comes to celebrating things like Juneteenth, where we must, as Scott said, be the loudest voices that celebrate when oppression comes to an end, because Jesus is the one who ended all oppression for all time. We, the church of Jesus Christ, must be the loudest voice in celebrating that. But here's how we do that. Not in grasping for power. Oppression is not the answer to oppression. The answer to I feel oppressed is not I'm going to grab for power so that I can oppress the oppressor. That's a trap and a lie and everyone dies. The truth that sets us free is when we seek to understand, to listen, to love, and to sacrifice in that love as we come alongside those who are different than we are, to understand them, to know them, to love them, to support them, even if and when they believe differently than we do. As Christians, we don't return evil for evil. We overcome evil with good. As Christians, we don't hate our enemies and cancel them on social media. We pray for our enemies and we show them love in word and deed. There is such a different way that we as Christians are to interact when it comes to issues of oppression and race and gender and everything else involved there. Such a different way because, beloved, you've always been more than the color of your skin. You've always been more than the color of your skin. You're an image bearer. It doesn't mean the color of your skin doesn't matter. It does. And it comes with purpose and value and story and glory. Have you read the book of Revelation that talks about the end where it's every tribe, tongue, and nation? It's going to look like a rainbow of people coming to, to declare with one voice, Jesus Christ is Lord. You're in our lives. We're in your lives on purpose for that reason. We are supposed to look and sound and act like heaven here in this church. So fighting for understanding and unity and love, not fighting one another, is what the path of self-denial and not self-protection looks like. What about when it comes to dads? Today's Father's Day. And for many of us, it's a trigger. It's a beautiful thing to remember, but if you've got a great dad who's not here anymore, that's also a trigger. What do we do? How do we cope? What does it look like? 
How about instead of choosing to protect ourselves even from the pain of loss, we enter in? How about instead of choosing to stay angry and feeling justified about it, we choose forgiveness and watch the power of grace at work? I want to tell you a story to this end. This will be what we end with this morning. It's my story. Some of you are aware of this, and maybe these details not so much. My relationship with my dad and his relationship with our whole family was not very good. He came from a broken home. My mom came from a broken home. And one of the things that they struggled with mightily was money. So money's always been an issue to talk about for me and for my family. It's been a struggle. One of my earliest memories of choosing the path of self-denial was when I was six years old living in Queens Village. You see, a couple weeks before Christmas, my dad had set up his model train set in the basement of our Queen's house. And it was one of the first things he'd ever really done, like with me, uh, other than go fishing. And so it meant so much to me. I loved that model train set. And I remember Christmas morning, um, I learned a hard lesson. You see, when, when money is your security, when money is your power, when money is your life, then you don't ever get the privilege to ask for more. And if you've been given more, you better, you better show some appreciation for that sacrifice. For on Christmas morning, there were a bunch of Christmas gifts that undoubtedly they sacrificed for. But I opened up and I thought, wow, these are great. Dad, can I go downstairs and play with the train set? At which point he smacked me across the face and sent me up to my room. because I didn't show appreciation for the sacrifice when it came to money. From that point forward, I chose the path of self-protection with my dad. I justified my hatred of him because it kept going. It wasn't just that. Please don't hear that. But that was one of many little stories along the way that taught me to do this when it came to my own dad. And while I never stole from him, like the manager in our story for today, you know what I stole? I didn't steal money. (laughs) I stole life. Decades of my life that he was not a part of. I shut him out because he deserved it. Because he wasn't safe, and that was true, but he deserved it. And the end result was I was robbed I was robbed, and he was robbed. Together we were robbed of life, of what could have been, of what we could never work through, because he didn't deserve it, or so I thought. This is a picture of myself, my mom, and dad in March when we were in Virginia, and we took my mom out for her birthday as we were coming back from the Dunamis Conference. And uh, as many of you know, uh, I've been struggling with some major back issues this year. And so I've gone, I've had two MRIs, I've gone to see a multitude of doctors and rehabs and stuff, and so as you can imagine, the medical bills got really steep. So where we were already struggling financially, This was what was putting us over the top. And uh, out of nowhere, I get a letter in the mail from my dad, who's on a fixed income, struggling, I'm sure, just to make ends meet. He wrote me a check that I know was sacrificial to him without any questions asked and just said, I love you, son, and I want to be there for you. Can I tell you how much that meant to me as a son? Not just that he wrote that check, but that we got there, that we got there, that it took 40 freaking years, but that we got there and that our story isn't over. 
because my dad chose the path of self-denial. And the result was life, abundant life in our relationship, in my home. It blessed me to be able to pay some medical bills that I couldn't afford. And all of a sudden, there's more trust being built in a relationship that has always struggled to have it. Beloved, why am I sharing this story with you? Because the love of money is a trap that pits us against one another and that robs us of life and of joy. And when we come surrendered to the one that we can trust with every ounce of our lives, money becomes a weapon to use for one another, a gift, a treasure to give away to those in our domain who have needs, who are hurting, who need to receive love at just the right time. And when you make that choice, heaven comes. Heaven breaks in. Where is God challenging you this morning? First and foremost, with his love. The love of a dad that's better than any earthly father who welcomes you with all of your junk and muck to come find cleansing waters that are designed to set you free, to wash you clean. And then secondly, to surrender. Here's my money, Lord, because here's my heart, Lord. Have it all and use it for your glory. You know what he'll never say to that prayer? No. It's always yes. It's always yes. Let me pray for us. Jesus, this morning we come into this place, each of us with our own story and struggle, all of us with burdens and wrestlings. And I would dare declare that all of us in different ways have been deceived. But Jesus, you are the way the truth and the life. You are the light himself. You are love incarnate. So when we come to you, you don't simply expose that to to shame us. You expose that to wash us clean, to set us free. This morning, Lord, what we're asking is for you to do more and more of that work, that you would set us free, God, that you would wash us clean, that the shame and guilt would be gone, that the old wounds would find healing in our healer. It's you alone, Jesus. That, Lord, that prayer that you prayed in Luke 4 that Scott quoted earlier, good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom for the captives and oppressed, the year of the Lord's favor, that that would break in all the more in our own hearts and lives, that you would use us in one another's lives to be that, your voice, your hands, your feet, your pocketbook, your checkbook, but that, Lord, you would then turn us and show us, Lord, where we are to be that for one another. Jesus, as we've already declared, There is no one like you. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. And my hands will do the same. Here's my money, Lord. Because here's my heart, Lord. Take it. Take it, Lord. And use it for your glory and for our good. Jesus, we plead your blood, and we ask for more, more of you and less of ourselves this morning. Come, Holy Spirit.